for so many people, history is not about primary source documents. It's not about empirical evidence. It's a story that they're told. It's a story that they tell. It's an heirloom that's passed down over generations where loyalty takes precedence over truth. Hello and welcome to the Bulwark's Next Level Sunday interview. I'm your host, Tim Miller, and I'm honored to be here today with Clint Smith, author of the New York Times bestselling How the Word Has Passed. He's an Atlantic scribe, and he has a book of poems out this year called Above Ground. So we're going to get into all that. Clint, thanks so much for doing this, man. Happy to be here. So I want to discuss with you uh, Reckoning with America's Racial Legacy, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Identity Politics, New Orleans, Fatherhood, College Athletics, Writing Poetry. We've got about 52 minutes. How does that sound? You think we can hit it all? I think we can cover <laughs> every, every single contour of that. Yeah. So let's do it. <laughs> um, I want to start with your book, um, How the Word is Passed, um, which was so good and important in ways that I want to kind of talk about for me. Uh, but for those who haven't read it, um, uh, just maybe just give us a quick thumbnail sketch of of what the book was, what you're trying to do with it. Yeah. So in 2017, I watched several Confederate statues come down in my hometown in New Orleans, statues of PGT Beauregard, Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee. And as I was watching those statues come down, I was thinking about what it meant that I grew up in a majority black city in which there were more homages to enslavers than there were to enslaved people. And thinking about, well, what are the implications of that? What does it mean that to get to school, I had to go down Robert E. Lee Boulevard? To get to the grocery store, I had to go down Jefferson Davis Parkway. That my middle school was named after a leader of the Confederacy, or that my parents still live on a street today named after someone who owned hundreds of enslaved people. Because the thing is, we know that symbols and names and iconography, they're not just symbols, they're reflective of the stories that people tell. And those stories shape the narratives that communities carry. And those narratives shape public policy. And public policy shapes the material conditions of people's lives. And that doesn't mean that if you just, you know, go around and take down statues of Robert E. Lee, you suddenly erase the racial wealth gap. Or if you change the name of Jefferson Davis Elementary School, you suddenly create more economically egalitarian schools. But I do think it helps us recognize the ecosystem of of ideas and stories and narratives and and help us identify the way that certain communities over the course of history have been disproportionately and intentionally harmed um, by certain narratives um, around American history. And, and so I've been thinking a lot about, well, how are these stories propagated? How are these stories told? What To what extent are the people and places that have a relationship to this history telling the story honestly, running from their re- responsibility to tell the story honestly, or kind of doing something in between? So I started looking around New Orleans, asking those questions, um, and then realized that the story was obviously much bigger than New Orleans. Um, And I basically spent four or five years traveling across the country, visiting plantations, prisons, cemeteries, uh, museums, monuments, memorials, cities, neighborhoods, uh, trying to understand how our country reckoned with or failed to reckon with its relationship to the history of American slavery. And to sort of examine how the, the scars of slavery are etched into the landscape of this country um, in places that would seem self-evident and in places that might not. Yeah, the one, um, I want to start with your uh, trip to the Blanford Cemetery in uh, in uh, Petersburg, was it, yeah. Virginia? Um, and you had these conversations with uh, the people that worked there, Martha and Ken, it's a Confederate soldier cemetery, and um, kind of wanted to get into that, but but just share with folks, like, just the contours of those conversations you had with the people that were that were working at that cemetery, and 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 how that kind of led you to to the uh, Memorial Day ceremony, yeah. if you will. You know, it's interesting because I, it's hard to imagine the book without that chapter in it. But yeah. one of the wonderful things about writing a project like this um, and working on this sort of creative nonfiction project, working on this sort of project that is based, that's sort of a travel log. Um, is that the place, some of the places in the book are places that I knew I was going to go. And then some of the places in the book are places that when I wrote the book proposal, I didn't know where, that I was going to go there. Um, and so the Confederate Cemetery uh, at Blanford was was one of those places that I did not write in my book proposal. I didn't say in my book proposal, I'm going to go spend the day with neo-Confederates and members of the Daughters of the Confederacy and Sons of Confederate Veterans, because I don't think my wife would have let me out the house. <laughs> um, but I... I thought I was going to write a chapter on uh, Civil War battlefields. And so I went to Petersburg and I thought I was going to do uh, this sort of 
meditation on the siege of Petersburg and um, the battlefields where, you know, so many thousands of soldiers were killed uh, at the end of the Civil War. And I was there and I was having a conversation with the um, park ranger and the park ranger. I was telling him about my book project and he was like, oh, that sounds really interesting. You should go to this Confederate cemetery down the road. And it's almost like in the movies where like the devil and the angel <laughs> appear on your shoulders. And it was like on one shoulder was Ryder Clint and the other shoulder is regular Clint. And so regular Ryder Clint is like, we got to go to the Confederate cemetery. And regular Clint is like, we are absolutely not going to the Confederate cemetery. You're out of your mind. But I'm, I'm grateful. One of the reasons I'm grateful to be a writer is because I think it, especially in those sort of moments, pushes me to go to places uh, and um, navigate spaces that I otherwise might not go to. Like on my own, I don't think that I would ever feel compelled uh, on my own accord to just go spend the day um, at with the Sons of Confederate Veterans on Memorial Day. Uh, but that is where the story was taking me. And, and so I decided I need to follow it. Yeah, so talk about get, you know having those conversations, right? You're going to the cemetery and, and talking with the people that work there, um, and you end up going to the, this kind of uh, event with, for the Sons of the Confederate Veterans and, and trying to talk to some of the attendees. Obviously, you stand out. I don't think there's a lot of black folks probably going to the Confederate Cemetery. <laughs> um, and so, you know, there's, there's a journalist way to kind of engage in those conversations, right? It's like, oh, I'm just trying to gather information. What does this person think? And then you know, it felt like you were doing some of that, but then also a little bit of, you know, trying a more human way, right? Like trying mm -hmm. to have a conversation with somebody and, and tease out like what it is that is motivating them, why they're there. So just, just talk about those conversations and how comfortable you were and, and, you know, what kind of tools you use to, to try to draw people out in those settings. Yeah. I, I remember in particular a conversation with a guy named Jeff and Jeff uh, had this round belly, this salt and pepper uh, handlebar mustache, this long ponytail, this Confederate uh, biker vest that had Confederate paraphernalia all over it. And when we were having a conversation, he was telling me about how his grandfather used to bring him to the cemetery uh, and they would sit in this beautiful white gazebo that sits at the center of the cemetery. And his grandfather would pull out his banjo and play the old Dixie anthem. Uh, his grandfather would tell him stories about the men who were buried in these fields, how brave they were, how um, courageous they were, how strong they were, how resilient they were. Um, they He would tell stories about how the men who were buried in these fields didn't uh, fight a war over slavery. They didn't fight a war uh, over um, anything that had to do with race. It was all about states' rights. It was all about uh, protecting themselves against the, the war of northern aggression, the sort of Yankee invasion, uh, maintaining their culture, the importance of state sovereignty, tariffs, you know, the sort of um, greatest hits of the lost cause. Yeah. And, and also, you know, as he's telling them in these stories and saying secession had nothing to do with slavery and, you know, they're watching the sun set behind the trees and they're watching the sky turn from blue to orange to purple to black. They're watching the... Uh, fireflies come out of the forest and hop from one tombstone to the next. They're watching the deer come out from the trees and sort of graze around these uh, gravestones. They, you know, it's it's filled with this deeply sentimental uh, sort of sensory experience, these deeply sentimental memories. And Jeff talks about how now he brings his granddaughters to that same cemetery and he sings the same songs on the same banjo that his grandfather sang to him. Uh, tells the same stories that his grandfather told him to his grandchildren, watches the same sun set behind the same trees that his grandfather uh, and he watched. And so the thing is, you know, for Jeff, I could go to Jeff and be like, look, man, like I know your grandfather said secession had nothing to do with the Civil War, but all you have to do is uh, look at the declaration or secession had nothing to do with slavery. Yeah. Uh, and But all you have to do is look at the declarations of Confederate secession and see the state like Mississippi, Mississippi in 1861 said, you know, our quote, our position is thoroughly identified with the issue of slavery, the greatest material interest in the world. And so they're not vague about why they're seceding from the union. They're very clear about it. But what you realize in having these conversations is that if Jeff was going to accept that information, he would have to also accept that his grandfather was lying to him. And if he has to accept that his grandfather was lying to him, it threatens to disintegrate the foundation of a relationship he has 
with this man who he loves, this man who he not only loves on an interpersonal level, but who also represents an entire community, an entire family, an entire way of life that has been fundamental to shaping how Jeff understands who he is in the world. So suddenly it's not this thing where you're asking Jeff to just accept this empirical evidence that's right before him. You are serving as a catalyst. You're providing evidence that serves as a catalyst for an existential crisis. And I think that that is that's the centerpiece of this, right? It's so much of this is about identity. So much is yeah. about the story we have been told, the story we tell ourselves about ourselves. Uh, and part of what you realize is that for so many people, history is not about primary source documents. It's not about empirical evidence. It's a story that they're told. It's a story that they tell. It's an heirloom that's passed down over generations where loyalty takes precedence over truth. And so for me, those conversations you know, with Jeff and others, they were really important because it helped me take seriously the the emotional underbelly that sort of like undergirds these often bigoted, violent, yeah. um, ahistorical beliefs, it, which isn't to excuse it, which isn't to say, uh, justify it or to say, oh, well, now I understand it's it. I think it is if we are going to attempt to understand why millions of people across this country to various gradations hold on to beliefs that are so clearly untrue, uh, that are so clearly ahistorical. We also have to take seriously the emotional texture of their lives and their lineages that make the stakes so high for a recalibration uh, in the context of recalibrating history. And I think, you know, that's in the context of the Confederacy and, uh, you know, Confederate reenactors and neo-Confederates. But I think there's a version of that that's happening across the country now, right? It's the same thing that we're seeing with the, you know, the history wars, so to speak, um, where so many people are um, fearful of accepting a fuller, more honest, more complex, more uh, multifaceted uh, story of the American experience, the story of American history, in part because it means that this, because their identities are, whether consciously or unconsciously, deeply tied to a previous story about America that people are now telling them is untrue or is partial or is misguided. Um, and if your identity is tied to an America that people are telling you isn't the actual America, then it creates again and can create this sort of similar existential uh, crisis for a lot of people. And that uh, then allows politicians to come in and wield it, uh, that fear as a, a really potent political weapon. Yeah, it was. Um, I'm happy you told that full story because was, I was listening to you talk about that conversation with Jeff in a different setting. It was, it was what inspired me to reach out to you, right? Because I think that at the Bulwark, like we, you know, all, not all of us, I guess, anymore, but when we started it, all of us were people that had left, you know, the Republican Party or at, at some level over the fact that we felt like um, we had seen that we'd been lied to, right? Like seeing Donald Trump take over and take that nomination made us kind of re like shook some of us and made us realize that, oh, wait, so what we thought this defined, like what we thought the definition of this was actually it wasn't. And and for some people, you know, I found, and, and for many of our listeners and, and not all of them, of course, we have, we have listeners across the ideological spectrum, but from the former Republican listeners, this was like part of their identity, right? Mm. And, 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 the part, and politics can be part of your identity in the, ra the way that race and identity is. And, and I feel like we're at our best when we're trying to figure out how we can kind of go back into the places where that we used to inhabit and talk to those people and, and, and find and, and, you know, with empathy, you know, but with honesty, you know, try to kind of pull them along, right? And and help them see the kind of cracks that we saw and help them see the untruths that we saw. And, um, and you know, we're not, I'm not, I'm first to say I'm not always that good at that. Sometimes I uh, succumb to mockery uh, or sarcasm instead, you know, because you can't help yourself. But I just, you, I, the, when I, this conversation that I'm talking about is kind of between close-ish you know, people in the, ident in the identity divide, right? We're mostly white. Let's just be honest. Like we're mostly, we all share like this, that one point we, whatever, like Ronald Wagon or whatever it is, or had an elephant, uh, you know, um, a sticker on our button. Uh, uh, you went into these spaces where the, where the gap is much larger, right? And so I'm just wondering, like, do you have any lessons from that? Anything from those conversations that made you think, man, this, 
this opened eyes, you know, maybe we opened each other's eyes in a way that was more effective when I took this approach or when I took that approach or, or any, anything. I'm sure you've thought about this uh, and the, kind of the fallout from having all these experiences. Yeah. You know, I think that part of the project of the book, whether I was at Blanford Cemetery, you know, which is one of the largest Confederate cemeteries in the country, 30,000, the remains of 30,000 Confederate soldiers are, are buried there. Um, whether I was at Monticello, whether I was at Angola prison, whether I was at in New York or Galveston, part of what felt important for me was that I wanted to genuinely understand why different groups of people believed what they believed. And so in the context of Blanford, if I were to go to that place and move through it with any semblance of an antagonistic disposition. Um, obviously, my, uh, you know, what sociologists will call um, my, uh, my sort of physical my response. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, my, um, who I am in relation to my, uh, the space that I'm in, uh, my positionality, yeah. uh, means that how people interact with me when I enter that space is already going to be different than how it would be if you were right. entering that space with the same goals, with the same questions, with the same uh, queries. And so for me, it was like, I just, I, I tried to approach it with the level of uh, generosity. I tried to approach it with a level of uh, honesty. I tried to approach it with and and not even try i mean i think my disposition is one of genuine curiosity like i genuinely wanted to understand how someone like jeff comes to so deeply believe in the things that he does in the face of evidence that runs to the contrary and in order to do that i mean i think i just i just asked a lot of questions um and and i also there were moments in which i shared my own perspective or my own response, but again, tried to do it not in an antagonistic way. So, you know, for example, you know, one of them would be talking about how, how much this land means to them, right? Like part of the conceit of the book and, and sort of my larger scholarly project in many ways is that uh, there's something so powerful about putting your body in the place where history happened, like your physical body standing in, you know, on a plantation, standing in a cemetery, standing on the train depot from which, you know, I've, you know, I wrote a story about Germany um, and how they remember the Holocaust, like standing in the uh, gas chamber, standing in the crematorium, standing on the train depot from which Jewish families were sent to, to Eastern Europe. Um, there's something for me so powerful about that, this sort of sensory experience of that. And it's also powerful for other people in different ways. And so, you know, I was talking to a guy at Blanford and he was like, it's so powerful for me to be here. You know, I feel the spirit of my ancestors. I feel the, um, the, the ghosts, the spirit sort of, um, arounding me, holding me up. And I was and in those moments, I'm like, thank you so much for sharing. That's really fascinating. Um, that that's your experience here because my experience is so different. Uh, and when I stand here, what I experience is this haunting, uh, unsettling feeling that I am standing amid the the ghost and the bodies of those who fought a war with a specific intention to perpetuate uh, and expand the institution of chattel slavery among my direct ancestors. And so, you know, it's just fascinating that we can both stand on this land and have such a different response to to. Uh, what it evokes yeah. um, within us. And I, and I think in those moments, like, I don't know that they've ever had anybody share that with them in that right. context. Um, and it's not to say, you know, I, I always want to be careful in these moments. Like I am not an advocate of like all black people need to do is like go to <laughs> Confederate, you know, memorials and Memorial Day celebrations and Ku Klux Klan, Ku Klux Klan rallies. Break and, and bread at diners gonna, in Trump yeah, country and you know, everything will be all right. That's, it's, it can be such a trope. Um, and so that's not what I'm saying. But I, I know for me, 
those sorts of experiences like i have no idea how they would uh, how they were impacted by my presence or not you know um but i know that all i can do is control my own way of engaging my own uh disposition um and and try my best to leave a space like that more fully and accurately understanding um the socio-historical and uh, sort of political dynamics that shape the world we live in today. Yeah, I want to give you a, I'm going to tell an embarrassing story really quick about myself okay. um, in the sense that I think that maybe this, um, what you're saying on a, um, you know, a, a smaller gradient, I guess, you know, these sorts of things do have a difference, like do make a difference when you start to think about the perspective of them. So my best friend uh, went to Ole Miss. And um, so like, I would go visit them back in college. This was before uh, Colonel Reb was still around then. Mm. Uh, the Mississippi flag was still Confederate flag. I'm from Colorado. I went to school at GW in the Northeast. So I was visiting Ole Miss. And, um, you know, as just kind of a young, bratish college Republican, like the like this, like this whole culture was was totally new to me, right? Like I didn't know any, like I didn't know any fucking sons of the Confederate veterans or anything like that. And so... In some ways, like the fact that when I went to Oxford, that they had the Confederate statue and these Confederate flags were around, like it felt kind of subversive and funny, actually, right? Like a little funny, right? That like in this day that and so I grabbed, I had like I was opening up a box a couple of years ago of my college stuff and I had like collected a couple of like Colonel Reb whatever like uh like a little little fl- a little picture of colonel reb and like a little colonel reb figurine right that i rem- I, I thought back about my younger self that i i remember thinking oh i'm going to bring this back to my like liberal campus and like people are going to be like offended and that's going to be kind of funny we're going to trigger people right and um i think about that now with like total shame and embarrassment right um but like the reason that i think about that differently now is that I have like I've been exposed to a lot more black folks. I know I have a black daughter. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. I've read your book. I've read other books, and I'm like, I, it, I never put myself in the shoes of what a black person walking through Oxford feels like. With and there's history in Oxford there too, right? What a black person feels like walking down where James Meredith walked that I walked by, right? Like the, my feelings walking through that were totally different, and I didn't it didn't even cross my like 19 year old mind how it would feel to a 19 year old Clint. Mm. Right. And, um, and so all of that has changed like my perspective on this. And, and I think that obviously there's people, there's bigotry out there and that there are people that are deeply bigoted, but I, I wonder, uh, I, I, I say all that though, because I'm interested in asking you, you went to this, like this going to the sons of the Confederate veterans is, is all the way on the other end of the spectrum. Right. You see now on the internet, there are a lot of young 19 year old Tim's, Right, that like think this stuff is funny. That think the woke stuff is overstated. Right, that they're responding against it. They're trying to trigger people. Right, how how do you communicate, you know, the lessons of this book and the lessons of your life and your feelings to to folks on on that kind of have that perspective? Right, do you, do you think about that? Yeah, I think that I appreciate you sharing that story. Um, <clears throat> and and the honesty there uh i think that you can tell me i'm a dumb shit if you want it's okay <laughs> no, man, it's, <laughs> it's, it's cool uh, you don't have to do you don't have to do the appreciate thing <laughs> it's no, okay it's, it's a journey it's a journey for yeah. all i mean and and again it's not it's not to excuse like i mean part of right. part of what brought me to this book is because i realized that i was someone who grew up in a city that was the heart of the domestic slave trade, uh, that I am the descendant of enslaved people, that my grandfather's grandfather was enslaved. And I didn't understand the history of slavery in any way that was commensurate with the impact and legacy that it has left on this country. I think watching those monuments come down, watching the conversations happening, you know, in the early days of Black Lives Matter, when the you know, after Dylan Roof and Charleston. And I was like, oh, I don't, you know, this history is both within me and has been around me my entire life. And I am not someone who feels like I understand it to the degree that I should have. 
And so the very, the very construction of this book is one in which I am trying to fill the gaps in my own understanding. Um, and it is me recognizing that there were things that I was not taught that I probably should have been that would have helped me more fully understand who I am in relationship to my city, my state, my country. Uh, that would have more effectively helped me understand the reason one community looks that way and one community looks that way is not because of the people in those communities, but is instead because of the history is what it, of, of what has been done to those communities generation after generation after generation. So I think it would be broadly, I think it would be unfair of me to um, cast judgment upon people who who themselves are not cognizant of this history to the degree that I am or um, that more of us are now sort of 10 years after Black Lives Matter, or after everything that happened with George Floyd. With that said, I think there is a there's like a distinction between someone who doesn't someone who doesn't know a set of information, um, uh, but is open to learning new things and someone who is sort of antagonistic performatively yes. or otherwise to the information being presented. So on a personal level, I don't have any interest in attempting to like convince people to believe information when they are not in operating in good faith. Like that just isn't um, an effective use of my time. I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in like changing people's minds. I hope, you know, I, I, some of the most meaningful notes that I've gotten about the book and about my YouTube series, Crash Course Black American History, are from people who were like, I read this and shared it with my racist granddad and <laughs> and he watches Fox News all day, but he read your book and we were able to talk about this in ways that we had never talked about it before. Like that, that is deeply meaningful yeah. to me. I didn't write the book because of that. I didn't for write the, the racist book granddad. for, for the, yeah. yeah, I didn't write it for the Fox News watching granddad. I'm, I'm appreciative that that, you know, man or grandmother or person, whoever it is, um, can get something out of it. But the book was written for like a 15 year old version of me. The book was written because I wanted to write the sort of book that I needed in my high school American history class. Um, and anything else, you know, the, the benefits that it extends to anyone else are, um, are deeply meaningful, but they're not the sort of origin story of, of the project. So that's a long rambling way of saying, yeah, no, 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 that's, no, that's a relevant answer. I, I, because sometimes you can put out work that has impact that isn't what you, uh, you know, that wasn't your necessarily your intention, right? I guess what I'm trying to say is I think that there are, there's this, there's a backlash to the post George, like there's all this progress that's been made, right? This always happens. So I was sure. seeing on the gay stuff too, but there's right now, I think we're looking to this backlash to the whatever you want to call it, the racial reckoning, the Black Lives Matter post George Floyd thing. And and you see a lot of like young white folks, let's just be honest, that are bristling, right? And and are being performatively antagonistic mm -hmm. to, to the point that, that you're you're saying. And I think that um my view is that there are that works like yours, that there are ways that maybe this wasn't intentional and maybe that this is not, that's not the group that you care about. Um, but I, I think that there are ways to get at um, that kind of this young, you know, brat, privileged class that is different from, oh, you know, that, that makes them think about what it was, what it is like for the 19 year old version of them to have to consume the meat. Like for you, it was to have to walk past the monuments, right? And so, and, and they still do. They still have to. This, all, as you said, the street names in New Orleans are still the same. But to have to consume the memes, and and I think that there is a certain percentage of them that can be reached if they under, if if they're if they're thinking about it not solipsistic, solipsistically, right? If they're thinking about it as like how how is someone that does not look like me consuming this, and and I think that that that, that is to me. A value of uh, like the types of material that you're putting out, even if that's not intentional. And I appreciate that. Um, I, I I try to. I wanted the ethos of the book to be one of of grace and generosity, um, in part because so much of the folks, so many of the folks I spent time with, 
the tour guides, the public historians, the docents, you know, they were in many ways a model of the grace and generosity that I hope the book captures and because it's in part an ode to them. It's an ode to these people who work at these historical sites who encounter all sorts of people, you know, every single day in their work who are very much on the front lines of this history war. It's for the folks who are docents at Monticello who like every day have to deal with people who are in their face telling, <laughs> telling them, you know, that they know more about Thomas Jefferson than, uh, than the people who work there and that Thomas Jefferson <laughs> actually never owned slaves and that this yeah. Sally Hemings thing was a myth. And, you know, I mean, they, these are people who show up to these folk, these plantations and these sites all the time. And so there is a, what I saw when I went to these places, you know, uh, or the Whitney plantation where, you know, there are folks who, who's every day, you know, they would, they ask, well, there were really good slave owners, right? Like, or they were really, they were really kind uh, it's like, you know, and so just really quick, the Whitney, I just like, for people who don't know, the Whitney plantation, um, is, is here, it's outside of New Orleans and it is, um, you know, essentially trying to commemorate, commemorates maybe the right word, memorialize, mm. right? Like what happened to, to slaves. And there's so many plantations around, around the South where people like have weddings here and shit, you know, and, and they talk about, I think you write about how they talk about the windows and the architecture, you know, and at, at Whitney, they're trying to talk about, no, the actual experience of people that, that had to live on the plantation. And for me, like the biggest takeaway of that section was, was the living history element of it. That how how that some of the buildings on the plantation people that the slaves lived in were like their descendants were living in till what the nineteen seventies, mm -hmm. you know. And so to me, I, to me that was powerful in that I'm, I, I still am an old Republican at heart. I'm not all the way there on reparations yet. But but it was like I was reading that chapter and I was like that anecdote was the best um, anecdote in favor of reparations I've ever read. Right? That mm -hmm. it was like that's crazy. And in the community around there, and to have people coming just back to your point, to people coming to the plantation seeing this just very vivid the experience that slaves went through and then wanting to ask the the tour guide well but there was a good slave owner right i mean that just shows you how how warped you know people get about their identity and not wanting to feel like they're bad you know no absolutely i mean it's, it's so much of it is people attempting to assuage their own uh sense of guilt their own shame their uh, wanting to sidestep any historical moral culpability, um, and and yeah, and they, so these docents and the folks were were a model of grace, a model of generosity, a model of patience, and so I wanted the book to to hold that um, in the same way, and and it is written in a way, you know, there are there are other books that are tackling similar subject matters um, that are written by people who are experts. And who wrote you when they began that book, they were experts. When they finished that book, they were experts. Right. I, I did not begin How the Word is Passed as an expert on the history of slavery. It, as I said, it was the opposite. Like, I began that book as somebody who felt deeply naive about a history that I was, that is my own. Um, and there was some shame in that. And so, you know, this, the book is written not as a, like, here are the 10 things you should have always known about slavery. Because one, I think there is, I think there can be value in polemic. I think there can be value in um, just naming things and saying this is important and we should all understand it. I don't know that that's my project. Um, I think my project is one in which I um, attempt to model a certain sort of curiosity um, and attempt to model what it might look like to fill the gaps in our own understandings of of history of the world um, of people whose lives are not like our own um, and that's that's the the book it's just like me going around asking a lot of questions and trying to to make sense of it and and i think that you know I, some of my favorite novelists are people whose stories have nothing to do with my own life right like i i love I love immigrant novels. Like I love stories about like f folks coming to this country from different countries. I love stories about first gen the first generation experience of Same. people in America. Like my, some of my favorite novelists are like Minjin Lee, Jhumpa Lahiri, um, uh, Mohsen Hamid, uh, like folks who are really writing about um, 
you know, an experience that is not my own. And, right. and I find value in it because it is, it is sort of a window into a set of experiences that aren't my own, um, but that still have a certain level of universality that I can um, tap into, that I can pull something out of. And so, you know, for folks who read this who aren't the descendants of enslaved people, um, you know, I, uh, my hope is that it's a similar sort of um, emotional and intellectual experience where maybe you are stepping into um, literally walking alongside me um, in many ways uh, to all these different places, um, getting access to information and stories that that you might not otherwise have encountered um, otherwise. Um, what do you say to the part inside you that wants to be a diplomacist? that wants to say, fuck you, fuck you to these people. Um, like, how did you navigate that? Yeah, I mean, I also don't want to misrepresent it as me being like this constant well of like endless <laughs> grace. grace and generosity. Like, that's, that would just, that's not true. Um, I, am, I, am, I am deeply imperfect um, and inconsistent in how I attempt to extend grace and generosity to others and to myself. Um, and it's something that I wake up and try to work at every day. Um, and so I, I by no means want p people to be like, wow, Clint is just like, he's just every day. He's just walking up to racists and being like, it's okay. I understand <laughs> that your father told you a story. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, that's not the case. Um, but it is what I, I think that for me, I, I think about how I have changed and evolved on certain things in my own life um, and positions that I've previously had that were largely because people who did not have to extended grace and generosity to me, even when it may have been burdensome to them. Um, and again, it's not to say that it is any group of people's responsibility to be yeah. a constant ambassador on behalf of any different facet of their identity, black, queer, immigrant, whatever the list goes on. Um, but I, at my best, try to, again, very imperfectly um, and, and often inconsistently, extend grace to people in the way that grace has been extended to me. Um, and then, you know, and then when, it, and I, when I can't do that, I try to like, I think there's also value in having a community of folks that you can go to and, and like complain about shit without, <laughs> you know, any sort of implication, right? I might, yeah. I try not to do that on Twitter. I try not to get on, you know, get on social media and yeah, do your it. Twitter um, is boring, man. I was going through it <laughs> looking for questions for you and it's just like soccer re and retweets of, of inspiring people. Anyway, oh, you man. Know. No, I where's know. the I'm, hate? I'm off it now. I'm like, yeah. I, have, I haven't tweeted in, in a, some time. Um, and I don't, I can't, you know, that's a whole nother thing, but um, but yeah, toward the end of my Twitter life, it was basically all, all soccer Twitter content. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I do think there's, it's important to have people that you can go to, you know, close circles of, of community and friends and just, and talk shit and complain and get it off your chest and, and then keep it moving and try to be the sort of empathic, humble, thoughtful person. Yeah, in the wider world, but you know, we're all human and we're just, we're just a bunch of people trying to do our best. Yeah. Um, I want to get into your book of poems about fatherhood. And I want to kind of, uh, go through your new Orleans childhood a little bit on the way there, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. and, and if you won't mind indulging me. So I, as I told you uh, when we spoke over email, I moved here and, uh, raising our daughter here that we adopted and she, um, she's in kindergarten here now in, in new Orleans. And I'm, and as you mentioned in the podcast, you talked about how you wrote the book a little bit to young Clint, I guess to high school Clint, not to kindergarten Clint. <laughs> and so I'm, uh, no I'm pictures in this one. Yeah, I'm wondering, you know, just talk about that experience of growing up in New Orleans. And I, I think I've seen you talk about the gratitude and fear living together and just this, you know, the there's the darkness of New Orleans, but there's also the beauty and you know, I, I would just love to hear about your that experience growing up here, how it informed the book and how 
you know, if you wouldn't mind, um, you know, maybe looking back, like, were there things that you wish you would have gotten more of of the city or were there things you wish that you would have, you know, not to criticize your own parents, but gotten exposed to or, or whatever, something that might be relevant for me as I, as I navigate that challenge? Yeah, well, I'm jealous, um, first and foremost. I uh, Doors open, man. Water's warm. I know. Warm. Look, look. Tell my no, wife. No, literally. It's, it's, uh, I, we're, we're, uh, I'm trying to convince her. Um, and maybe one day, maybe I'll retire there. But um, so it's interesting. Her Hurricane Katrina was my senior year of high school. Um, and so it, it, I'm 35 and it kind of, uh, you know, pretty cleanly bifurcates my life uh, into the sort of before the storm and after the storm, which is also the marker of time that so many people in new orleans use for for so many things you know like was that before the storm or after the storm um and i finished high school in houston texas uh, and then went to college and grad school and got a job and all that jazz so i've spent the sort of latter half of my life trying to make sense of and process both the impact that katrina had on the trajectory of my life um and also more broadly like what growing up in new orleans did to me for me how it shaped my sensibilities how it shaped my um my personality how it shaped my interests um you know i you don't fully appreciate like when you're born in, in a place and maybe this is so many of us but like when I was born and raised in New Orleans, I didn't fully appreciate what it meant to be a New Orleanian in relative to being from anywhere else. Um, cause it was, it was, you know, it's like, I was like a fish in the water. Right. Like it was yeah. just, it was the water around me. It was all I knew. Um, and then you leave and you realize how unique that place is relative to anywhere else in the world. I mean, it is just such a special place, an imperfect place, a place that, um, you know, has its angels and demons, so to speak. Uh, but, but it is a place that gave me, gave me something that I don't think any other city in the world could have given me. Um, and, and we were just there for Thanksgiving, uh, last week. And, and I try to, you know, I have this thing of like wanting my kids to I have a six-year-old and a four-year-old wanting them to go to so many of the places that were so instrumental and so formative for me as a child to want to recreate experiences that were really memorable for me. Um, and it's me trying to fit it into like four day chunks during, yeah. during the holidays. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, there's, there's kind of no place like it. And, and it's, it's interesting because I've never, I never lived there as an adult. And so my memories of it are also through the lens of childhood, yeah, um, right. which is different. And then like, I sometimes wonder like what my relationship to the city would be as an adult. Cause the growing, you know, being 14 in a place is very different than being 34 yeah. in a place. You've grown concerns. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You don't absolutely. have to care about the potholes or the insurance rates going up absolutely. or anything like that. Yeah. yeah. And so, so, you know, it's, it's a place that is, is so it means so much to me um and and it's a place that perhaps more than anything else in my life has um like shaped who i shaped my writerly instincts um shaped my you know people sometimes ask me or either ask me or tell me you know I'll, like there'll be a list online and be like you know 20 southern writers you should yeah. or whatever and sometimes i'm like oh yeah like I, I, I live in Maryland now, which is, I mean, that's a whole different podcast. Like it is the South, but it's not, it's, yeah. it's, it's also it's not. like not, it's, it's not, you know, like Silver Spring, Maryland is, uh, not the South. It's not the South in the same way that the, the South South is the South. Um, I but, wonder, uh, um, yeah. I just made to direct like one thought about it, like thinking about it through my daughter's eyes, because it's just I, this one little anecdote. I'm going to embarrass my friend if he's listening to me, but, um, it, it connects with your book and, um, I think it speaks to like the opportunities and challenges of, of 
growing up here. And um, so he uh, messaged me, and uh, he's uh, white, uh, obviously. And he said he's going there and take their kid to, to Angola rodeo. And he was like, we're going to take the kids. And I was like, I'm not taking my fucking kid to the Angola rodeo. Like, what are you talking about? Right? Mm-hmm. Like, and, um, and, and this is a chapter in your book where you talk about going there, and it's this prison rodeo. And you can talk about that if you want. Um, but I just think about that and, like, um, you know, right, there's this white southern culture here. Right. Where it's like that, you know, where they, you know, appreciate all of the black culture and the music and the food, et cetera. But then you can go to the Angola Rodeo and not even think twice about it. Right. Mm. And then there's this like black like culture and history and community that, you know, and and I'm very and, you know, I'm very much betwixt in between, like with my daughter and trying to make sure that that she has all this exposure to the latter when like the exposure of the former is going to be thrust upon her. You know, mm. uh, in a way that might not have been had we stayed in California, mm. you know. Um, and so anyway, I just I kind of wonder about your experience navigating that um, as you were growing up. Yeah. Can I ask was your when your friend was like, we're going to the Angola rodeo, was it in a like an ironic way or like a, like, oh, we're going to go and have this be a uh, teach our kids about the like cruel insidious manifestation no it was not no it was not about that i wish it was about that um but it was not Um, i see um it was not and and i just in there again it's not defending because i I think it's good but like contextualizing right Mm. it's like you grew up in you grew up in baton rouge and like that's just kind of something that you do you know yeah you know it It's interesting because, I mean, maybe to provide a little more context for Angola for folks before yeah. we move to the next part. Like Angola is the largest maximum security con- uh, largest maximum security prison in the country. It's 18,000 acres wide. It's bigger than Manhattan. It's a place where 75% of the people held there are black men. Over 70% of them are serving life sentences. And it is built on top of a former plantation. And I, I went to... Um, as I mentioned before, like I, I wrote a story for the Atlantic last year about how Germany memorializes the Holocaust. Yeah. And I went to Berlin, I went to Munich, um, and visited Dachau. And I remember walking into Dachau and, and looking around, uh, and experience, you know, walking through the gate and it's this vast haunting expanse of empty gray land. It's, you know, you look to your left, you see the remnants of the crematorium. You look to your right, you see the remnants of the, the barracks, and I just kind of closed my eyes when I was there and did this thought exercise. And I was like, what, what if on this land they built a prison? And in that prison, the vast majority of the people incarcerated there were Jewish. And it was so viscerally upsetting that I couldn't even fully finish. And then the people would exercise. come watch. I mean, you know, it's, it is, I think it was a sort of visceral and um, deeply unsettling um, prospect to imagine. Uh, And then I was like, well, here in Louisiana, we have the largest maximum security prison in the country where the remain, you know, where the vast majority of people are black men serving life sentences, many of whom pick crops while someone watches over them on a horseback with a gun over their shoulder. Um, And so thinking about the, the ways that what does it mean that that place is allowed to exist in that way on that land uh in a way that rightfully we we probably wouldn't allow uh in a different geopolitical context and and so you know to your original point i think louisiana new orleans are not so different than many places in that they are places full of contradictions. Um, That so many of the people, as, as you kind of alluded to, so many of the people who love your music, who love your food, who love to root for you, you know, clap for you down the parade route, who love to watch you play sports, um, will be the same folks who vote for uh, representatives who uh, have run on and and whose politics are predicated on 
stripping you of opportunities for upward mobility, stripping you of um, access to the social infrastructure that uh, would allow you to support your family, um, strip the health care. I mean, you know, the list goes on and on. And so there is that that dichotomy in many ways in New Orleans feels particularly pronounced because it people talk about New Orleans as a sort of melting pot. Like, oh, man, you walk around like, you know, you go to Jazz Fest, you go to Mardi Gras, you go to the yeah. French Quarter, or you you know, you're in these spaces. We're such a celebratory people. Um, there's like a different, as you know, there's a different festival like every weekend. Yeah. Um, and and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of intermingling or essential sure. intermingling in, in these places which can give you the impression that like, oh, well, this place is is unique relative to the rest of the South because like everybody like gets along and yeah. is occupying similar spaces. Um, but again, like the, the, the thing is that simply being in the same spaces doesn't mean people see, see you fully in the way that they see themselves. Like the, it, it's interesting because I talk all the time about the power and possibility of proximity, um, but proximity in and of itself is not a panacea. Right? Yeah. In many ways, you can be proximate to someone and it can further reify your prejudices um, and your conception of who you are in relation to, to them. So I think that in many ways in New Orleans, that's particularly pronounced, um, but, uh, but it's, such a, it's also such a human thing. You know, like we're full of moral inconsistencies, um, and and uh, but yeah, New Orleans still is is amid the contradictions, amid the inconsistencies, um, amid the imperfections, is is still, uh, I think, such a special place. Um, and if you're going to wrestle with the contradictions of the human condition anywhere yeah. um, you might as well do it while you can eat a poke yeah i gotta wrestle it in my family we're, we're, uh, we're already a, a couple of gay white guys and a former republican and a black daughter so that seems like as good a place as any way to we're anywhere to in, wrestle with that contradiction complexity yeah okay we're out of time um ish um i've got i've got two minutes so i want to i want to do two things i did not get to talk about your atlantic article about uncle tom's cabin mm. which is so good that people should just go read it and subscribe to the atlantic uh if they haven't um i haven't gotten to but half the other things I want to get to about your writing. So people should make sure to get how the word has passed and um, your new book of poems above ground. I want to just read one of them because it made me laugh. Is that okay with you? Yeah, read sure. one of your uh, re uh, books from above ground, um, which has, has a lot about fatherhood, but other issues. Uh, it's called gold stars. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, as a, as a gay dad, I just, ex I just, this hit with this hit so hard for me. <laughs> because <laughs> I just got so much love out on the street. Uh, but anyway, here it is. On the days when I'm out alone with my children, I'm made to feel as if I'm a saint or a god or the undisputed best father of all time. What I mean is that when I, we walk into CVS and my daughter is wrapped on my chest and my son toddles at my side, people stop and look and gasp and point and walk up to me asking to shake my hand. Men pat me on the back. Women touch my shoulder and touch their hearts. The manager at the front of the store comes on to the loudspeaker to say, Excuse me, may I have everyone's attention? On aisle seven, you can get three boxes of detergent for the price of two. And on aisle five, there's an incredible father running errands alone with his children. Everyone in the store bursts into applause. <laughs> It's just so good. I, I just, I, if you just could just give us one minute, like, where do you get. Uh, Excuse the rudeness of this question, but like, where do you get the balls to be like, I'm a poet and I'm going to write a poet about, I'm going to write a poem about being a dad in CVS and getting more credit than I deserve because it really, it's really wonderful. I, yeah, it's, it's always a, a delight to hear other people read your work. It's just like, um, so I really, I really appreciated that. Um, I mean, you know, so that poem, well, part of what it goes on to say in the second half uh, of it is like, I get all of these plaudits. I get all of these applause. And, and I think there's a particular, I think it's for all men. Cause I think this is the way that sexism and patriarchy operate. Uh, I think there's a, an additional sort of valence, um, an additional sort of layer around being a black man, um, because it runs counter to so many people's conceptions of like the role that black men play in their children's lives. Um, and just like talking about, 
you know, walking into spaces, especially when my kids were little, little, but even still now, like if I'm alone with my kids, people just kind of gawking and being like, wow, like, look at this guy, father of the year. It's amazing. I bet he, he changed his kid's diaper. He, ba- look at him babysitting his kids. Like what? It, and it's like, um, just, uh, for me, it was important as both a man writing a book about fatherhood and as someone who's is a, you know, is a father is a person in co-parenting alongside someone who, um, you know, a, a woman who doesn't get uh, acknowledged for doing the exact same thing in the same yes. way. It felt very important for me to name directly uh, the ways that um, men are celebrated for doing things that their counterparts, their female counterparts are uh, are often not. And it's not to say, as I say in the poem, it's not to say I don't want people to tell me I'm doing a good job. Like, you know, I I try to be a really good father. Like that's something that I take a lot of pride in. That's something I I invest a lot of myself in. And it's nice when people see that and and acknowledge you for it. The problem is when they acknowledge you and don't acknowledge the mother, in part because of the societal expectations that like, oh, this is just what mothers are supposed to do. Whereas like anything that a dad does beyond, you know, patting his kid on the head and having a job is is seen as like a uh, bonus, you know, like the extra gold star. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, no, and and I try to to add. I think there are opportunities for humor to to exist in a lot of these poems. Like this, this book was really a delight for me to to write because it got it allowed me to tap into humor in my writing in a way that I I kind of obviously didn't in um, how the word is passed given the subject matter. Right. But uh, but I think it also allows people to maybe humor in, in writing can be really effective in that. It allows people to enter or hear something um, or enter a set of ideas uh, that might otherwise be like more off putting. So if you can make a poem about, you know, how dad get that get more, gets more credit than mom for doing the exact same thing, but like make it kind of funny, but also but not funny at the expense of its truth. Right. Um, I think maybe you can um, get the attention of some folks who might otherwise be like, I'm not going to read this poem about patriarchy. Yeah, right. You know? Exactly. That's so good. All right. Well, I suspected we're out of time. But if you would indulge me, my, uh, we, we're not going to be able to make it through all the rapid fire. But uh, you kind of alluded to the fact that you've changed your mind on things as, as an adult. And my rapid fire question for every guest at the end, uh, one of them is, what is something you've changed your mind about? So if you'd share that with us, we can, li- we can leave that as the final word. Something I've changed my mind about. Something man. you've changed your mind about. Um... I change my mind all the time. <laughs> um, something I've changed my mind about. I hmm. I don't know if this counts, but I've been um, working on my next book, which is uh, about World War II sites around the world um so it's a similar conceit to how the word is passed but it's about world war ii memorials and monuments and museums around the world and i was recently in korea um studying the history of um, women who were forced into sex slavery by the japanese military korean women um these hundreds of thousands of women it's you know systematized sex slavery It's, it's a horrific um period of history and what's interesting is that you can't study that without also thinking about, um, I'm doing a terrible job at like, no, no, this fire. Is, no, that's um, fine. No, I didn't expect this. I didn't expect you to be good at rapid know, fire, to be I honest. Know. Oh man. It's, I, this, is, this is, this is, we're just on your time now. You can give a 20 minute answer if you want. This is the- <laughs> um, but, but what's interesting is that you have, when you study the history of the so-called comfort women, um, you also have to study the history of Japanese um, imperialism and colonialism of Korea. Right. And it just is interesting because like my conception of colonialism for so long has been like black pe- or brown people subjected to colonial violence from white people, from Europeans. Yep. And it just really complicates the, the Japan Korea relationship complicates any sort of, um, homogenous notion of colonialism or imperialism, right? Because it's the Japanese colonized Korea. And the way that you read about Japanese people talking about Korean people 
is is not dissimilar to how you would read about Portuguese people talking about Angolans, right? Or Senegalese people or Gambia. And it's just so fascinating to see the the way that oppression uh, and the way that justifications of colonial violence manifest themselves in all sorts of different cultural contexts. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, another example of this is like, the English and the Irish, right? Like sure. the way that the Irish conceive of themselves as a colonized people relative to um, the British. Whereas, you know, from for a long time, I was like, these are just both white people. Like, what are they talking about? Um, and and I think story, you know, being in Korea and thinking and reading books about Ireland and I, my, my conception of the possibilities and the contours of colonialism um, are much more uh, complex than they previously were. That count, not only does that count, that is very timely and a thought provoking way for people to end. Uh, we can just do a six hour one next time. So just <laughs> let me know. You got nothing else. You got nothing else in your agenda, right, Clint? Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, holler at me next time you're in New Orleans. Thank you so much for your time. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving and uh, we'll be back on Wednesday uh, with, uh, with JVL and Sarah. Thank you so much, brother. Absolutely.